I'm delighted to be joined now by Jane Hartley, the new United States Ambassador to the United Kingdom, in an exclusive interview, The Diplomat's First Since Arriving in Post in May. Ambassador, thank you for inviting Times Radio to speak with you at your London residence, Winfield House. The UK is delighted that you've arrived, but I have to ask you, it hasn't gone unnoticed that it took President Biden more than a year to nominate you after around 30 other countries had already received their uh, pick for US ambassador. It's suggested to some people that Britain isn't very high up the priority list for the US. So is that right? And why did it take so long? No, that's totally untrue. And, And actually, the White House... Um, has said to me many times that this is their key relationship, as as we see from our relationship in terms of what we're doing in Ukraine right now. Our Senate process is a complicated one, uh, and it has taken longer than I would have hoped. I will say, uh, when I did finally get through, it was um, unanimous, which is somewhat unusual in our Congress, and I'm very, very happy about that. And one of the reasons I did get through was because... um, Uh, Our country and our White House and our president and myself knew that I had to be here for Platinum Jubilee to honor and respect the Queen. Uh, And we did, uh, our process in the end did move rather quickly. Uh, I was confirmed unanimously on a Wednesday night. On Friday, uh, I was sworn in at the UN and on Sunday I was on a plane here. And have you had an audience with President Biden since accepting the nomination? What's he said to you uh, about the role and his view of UK-US relations? I've seen the president um, when I was back there in March. Um, Listen, the the relationship between the UK and the US is deep and it's strong. And it's, it's, it's not just president to prime minister. It's throughout all of our government. Um, So when I was back there, I also met with the head of our Joint Chiefs, I met with our Treasury Secretary, I met with um, the Department of Defense, and, and, uh, and many others. And frankly, it is only the UK that has the relationship as deep and as strong in all of these agencies, and you know, we know um, we know uh, the importance of Five Eyes. Uh, now we know the importance of AUKUS as well. Uh, and there's no other no other partner, no other ally um, that we work with as closely, whether it be intelligence, security, military, and obviously the importance of economics on both sides of the Atlantic. And did the president give you any specific instructions about what he hoped you would do with your time here? You know, I think the key is that we strengthen the very, very, very strong relationship we already have. Um, As we see from um, what's happening in Ukraine, uh, the UK and the US are totally aligned, and we've really been partners. Um, And frankly, um, some of uh, what the UK has done on sanctions and on SWIFT and some other things, they've even even been ahead of us. Um, And I think, you know, whether it's to the White House or whether it's our our Congress, this is recognized. Uh, And when I was going through my confirmation hearings, everybody commented on the strength of the the UK response in Ukraine and how we're aligned on policy and how how important it is to have such a strong partner that can work with us um, and work with our allies. And I read your um, testimony to the uh, foreign, uh, c- the Committee on Foreign Relations in which you um, talked in very strong rhetorical terms about deepening those ties between the two countries. What in concrete terms could be done to make the link stronger? Well, I think as we talked about, um, the military, the security, the intelligence, um, I think that is by far our closest relationship anywhere in the world. Um, it truly is special. Uh, I just want to make sure that the process for sharing is seamless. And to be honest with you, um, I think it is from my from my early meetings here. There's a huge amount of trust. There's a huge amount of communication. We really truly do rely on each other. Um, so that is something I want to make sure continues. And if anything gets better, um, I think the economic ties between our two countries are really strong. We over have over a million jobs going back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, I'd like to make that even stronger, both government to government, um, but private sector as well. Um, There's a huge amount of interest. I'm I'm from New York um, and talked to many of the private sector companies. In my my life, I've gone back and forth between the public and the private sector. Um, And the UK is a hugely attractive um, country for investment. You know, great education, great skills, common language. 
Um, so I'd like to strengthen that because I think jobs, once again, especially coming out of COVID and the difficulty the whole world has had and the difficulty the US and the UK, um, anything I can do to help spur economic growth, especially among young people, is something I want to do. There are concerns in the UK that President Biden has a distinctly cool attitude towards the UK. He made that remark about um, being Irish and therefore perhaps not wanting to speak to the BBC. In recent weeks, he's raised eyebrows on this side of the Atlantic by comparing uh, Israel's treatment of the Palestinians to Britain's treatment of Irish Catholics. Um, I mean, it seems to be obvious that there is an element of antipathy there towards the UK based on the president's Irish ancestry, isn't there? I really don't think so. Um, I remember when I was um, talking to them about this ambassadorship throughout the White House and the president, um, they emphasized to me um, that this was the most important position and, and frankly without offending other ambassadors which I don't want to do but probably the most important ambassadorship because once again of this partnership that we have that we don't have with anybody else and and it's expanding you know five eyes and I say now AUKUS so uh, I think if you if you walk around the White House and whether talk to Jake Sullivan or national security advisor or the State Department Tony Blinken uh, the relationship with the UK and the and the personal relationship that the president has with the UK um, is incredibly strong. I mean, we know we know that we stand together. We know we have the same values. It's never been more clear than it is now in terms of our support for freedom and democracy, in terms of what we're doing in Ukraine. Um, and we know we need each other. And I think um, if you talk to the president, that's exactly what he would say. Interesting. Do you accept that it's incumbent upon you as ambassador to try and dispel that perception that has taken hold in the UK? And how are you going to do that? Well, listen, I don't, I don't think it's a correct perception. So I think how, you know, I don't think it's a correct perception. Um, what I want to do, as I said before, is try to make the relationship even stronger. I know how important it is. I have you know, walk those halls of Congress. I have talked to the Foreign Relations Committee. I have been in the White House with the NSC. I know Tony Blinken very well. I know what people think. And they think that the UK is our critical and closest ally. So I want to make sure I can get that out to the public so they know what I am hearing from the inside. It's interesting because, of course, you're a former US ambassador to France. And I was going to ask you whether particularly following Brexit and the way that the UK can no longer be that Atlantic bridge for America into the EU, whether France wasn't now a more critical partner for Washington. But it sounds like the answer is no. Listen, I, um, you know, what I've said before, UK, five eyes. I mean, we, when I was in France, obviously the US and France worked closely together, particularly on the ISIS threat. Um, particularly because of uh, France's involvement in Mali and Sahel and, in a positive way. Um, but as I said before, the closest relationship, where we share the most, where there is the most trust, we are expanding on Five Eyes with AUKUS, is the UK. And of course, President Biden popped over last summer to Carbis Bay for the G7 meeting, um, but he hasn't yet done a formal state visit. Mm -hmm. Is that on the cards in the next year? I'm certainly trying to get him to come, so uh, we would be aligned on that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know his schedule yet, um, but but I seriously um, would would love to have him here, and I I will also make that clear to the White House. I'm not sure how much clout I have, but uh, I'd love him to come, and especially once again because of what we're doing, because of this crisis in the world, because of this fight for democracy and liberty and freedom. Um, and how the two of us are standing so strongly together. And, and it's not easy, and it's not going to get any easier. So I would love him to come to just show um, how we as partners are really fighting the good fight. You know, I, to be very honest, I haven't been here that long, so I haven't talked to them that much about it. But um, he, he um, you know, I think the president will be traveling a bit more. You know, COVID was difficult for everybody including some of the travel. So I'm hoping, you know, that the schedules uh, will loosen up a bit. Uh, and I would think there's nobody in the White House who doesn't know how important the UK is. And in my view, symbolically, as once again, the two of us stand for, you know, stand strongly, 
UK has been leaning forward so much on, in, in terms of this. I mean, I heard that once again when I was going through the Senate. Many compliments on both sides of the aisle, by the way. Our ranking Republican on the Foreign Relations Committee mentioned it many times, you know, how positive and how strong the U.S. is. Uh, the U.K. was, whether it be on uh, weapons, on training, on sanctions, on, you know, um, the discussion with SWIFT, how, how you really have been leaning forward. So... Um, I think we'll have many visitors. I mean, I, uh, I am encouraging it. When I met last with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which was last last week or the week before, I encouraged him to come. He promised me he would. So I don't know how soon that will happen. Um, I had a discussion last Friday with our Secretary of Commerce, who's who's fantastic and obviously the former governor of Rhode Island, believes tremendously in economic development, understands how important jobs on both sides of the Atlantic are, believes in you know, interesting creative ways in terms of economic development, what we might do together. Um, she's told me she's gonna come. So I'm, I'm trying to get as many people over here as possible because I think it's important um, for, the, uh, uh, for people to get here, show the support for this, country, how closely we're working on so many other issues, and also get to know get to know your own government. We already had, um, since I've been here, we already had, um, a co um, this is co State Department Talks and Code, CODEL, I must have to stop myself, a congressional delegation of, of um, key senators that were over um, for the air show. Um, and I, um, during my confirmation, that is one of the thing I, uh, one of the other things I encouraged, and I promised uh, both Senator Menendez, who's the ranking Democrat, and Senator Risch, um, that any congressional delegations that came, we would make sure um, not only that we, they were treated well by the embassy, but that they met their key counterparts in the UK government. Because I think, once again, the dialogue, the communication at all levels is really important. Um, I've met with your wonderful ambassador in Washington, uh, Karen Pierce. Um, and I've met with other people in this government because I had some fantastic meetings, um, you know, in my second week here uh, and with the chancellor and, and others. You know, I've emphasized uh, that nothing, nothing, nothing can ever jeopardize the Good Friday Agreement. And that is, that is um, you know, a, a statement from the White House, um, from the president, from our national security advisor, from our secretary of state, and from our Congress, um, and that is not going to change. Now, what we would hope... May I just interrupt you there just to, just to make it clear uh, to our listeners? What precisely is it about the Northern Ireland Protocol that threatens the Good Friday Agreement? Um, well, one of the parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol that's really important is the co-executive function in, in government in Stormont. Um, and if that were not to continue right now um, with the certain political parties, I mean, you would know more than I, but certain political parties in, um, in uh, Northern Ireland, the DUP, I think in particular, um, uh, the protocol has become a flashpoint. Um, and until uh, one of the statements is until that is settled, they don't want to be back in a co-executive function. A co-executive function there has been really important in terms of Northern Ireland. It's created jobs, it's created peace, it's created stability, it's created investment. And one of the things I have said to various um, UK ministers and others that I've met with, um, we want to make sure that continues. There's a lot of American investment actually going into Northern Ireland right now. Um, instability or no decision um, slows that. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I would recommend. So what we say, and by the way, we don't say it just to you. We say it to um, the EU as well, which is what we would um, strongly advocate is private, quiet conversations, a dialogue that can move this forward in a positive way, because we think it's important for everybody um, to get this settled. But of course, the UK government argues that the Northern Ireland Protocol and tweaking that protocol, removing some of those obstacles, will allow the DUP to go back into storm and mm -hmm. get that executive mm -hmm. back up and running. Mm -hmm. It sounds on the basis of what you're arguing that you would back what the UK government is doing, therefore. Well, listen, I think, once again, what we're saying is please have conversations. Get this, get this dialogue going again. There has to be a way that both sides 
uh, could come to some agreement. You know, a negotiation is a negotiation. Everybody always has to give a little. But but this is this is an important time. Um, the Good Friday Agreement. It will be 25 years in April. Um, we want what we see up there: the peace, prosperity, and security to continue. Um, so what we would urge is, please, if, if we, you know, this is not, we are not part of this negotiation, but we would urge, please sit down, sit down privately, um, and let's see if there's a way to make this work for both sides. So it sounds like you want the dialogue to continue, the negotiations to continue. The U.S. is not, therefore, necessarily supporting the EU in its legal action that it's launching against Britain. You know, I don't want to comment on the EU, but you know, our our key commitment, our key statement here, our key policy, what we're really proposing privately and publicly is sit down and let's figure out how we can make this work for the sake of Northern Ireland, for the sake of the economy, for prosperity, for security. It's important, and you know, indecision is is never never a positive in terms of economic investment and things like that. Mm-hmm. Some uh, senior figures in Westminster um, believe that the Northern Ireland Protocol is poorly understood in Washington, and they think that there's a powerful Irish lobby um, that has skewered perceptions in Washington about it. Do you think there's anything in that analysis? You know, I've read that in the paper here. I actually disagree. I actually disagree. I think it's... um, it is is not it's not a small group in Washington. I, I don't know. In one of the publications, I think I read it was the Irish Caucus on the Hill. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the Hill. I know I know Capitol Hill quite well. I know the Senate and the House quite well. Um, this is not a small caucus. I, I think people are pretty aligned in both the leadership in the House, the leadership in the Senate, and most importantly, they're aligned with the White House. Um, you know, and you've heard Tony Blinken emphasize this, our Secretary of State, um, how important this is to the administration. But once again, what I w- want to make clear is we are we are also giving the same message to the EU. Mm-hmm. This is not one-sided. We're saying, please sit down um, for the sake of continuing, which is what, what is, has been very positive for Northern Ireland. We don't want we don't want that to stop. And just at the air show the other day, I was out there talking to American companies that are thinking of investing there. So I would suggest let's keep the growth going, let's keep the jobs going, let's keep the investment going, and let's get this decided. (laughs) Yes. And on that uh, topic of uh, growth and investment, how likely is it that there's going to be a free trade agreement? It does feel uh, in Westminster that there isn't a huge deal of appetite from the U.S. for that at the moment. Well, listen, I think the positive is there have been some fantastic meetings. Um, I met with Anne-Marie Trevelyan when I was last week or the week before, um, fantastic meeting. I was very, very impressed with her. Um, as I say, I was talking to Gina Raimondo on Friday, who said to give Anne Marie her regards. There's a lot of respect. Um, Catherine Ty, I had a big meeting with when I was there. There's a lot of respect between the two, and there's a lot of communication. I think that's a real positive. Um, so I don't know. I don't have the lead on this. I will make my opinion known. Uh, I would say the lead is USTR in the White House, but I will make my opinion known. You know, I've gone back and forth, as I say, f- between the private and the public sector. Um, so I am a supporter of trade. I understand how trade can create jobs. Um, and you're a supporter of a free trade deal? You're championing that? Well, I will make my opinion known. I, I do not have the lead. No. Um, but, but just to check, that is your opinion, or, or you think that trade can be benefited in I think as ways? long as trade creates positive jobs for U.S. workers... And a better, a better, a better living standard, better jobs, better life. It's a positive. I'm not going to be the one negotiating that, so that will be the USTR and and the White House and, and perhaps Gina Raimondo. Um, but I think everybody everybody understands that if you can create the right trade deal. It can be beneficial in terms of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, I know you don't want to be drawn too much on on British politics, but I've got to ask you. It's obviously been a very lively time since yes, you arrived yeah, in the country. It certainly has. <laughs> uh, and I would be fascinated to read your diplomatic cables uh, back to Washington. Um, presumably, with the Prime Minister being ousted, you are reporting that it's absolute turmoil, are you? Is Britain a bit of a political basket case in your eyes? No, 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 not at all, my lord. 
um, your system is is <laughs> much better. If, you, if you've looked at our primary system, you, you look extremely organized and efficient compared to what we do. Um, no, and you know, when I was back, as I say, I think I was, I don't remember, I was back 10 days ago, and um, um, I've been obviously communicating since. Uh, I had fantastic meetings when I was here uh, with both your chancellor and your foreign secretary. Um, they were both impressive, impressive human beings, impressive public servants, and my message back to Washington is our relationship is not going to change no matter who is elected. Uh, the strength of our relationship with both of these candidates will remain the same. That's interesting because I thought in one sense perhaps Rishi Sunak, obviously a green card holder, he attended Stanford University in the States. He's got a house in Santa Monica. He isn't the favorite for you, given his slightly closer ties? No, 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 no. Um, both these individuals, as I say, I had fantastic meetings. I appreciate them taking the time. They met me right after I came here. Um, and uh, impressive. Uh, where we're aligned on policy, that's just not going to change. <laughs>